Hey folks, it's Ray with Taste Radio. Right now I'm on a call with Teresa Zoe and Jeff Martin, the co-founders of Pip Snacks. Teresa, Jeff, how are you? We're doing awesome. Thanks so much for having us, Ray. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jeff, uh, before we uh, got started, I saw your backdrop was, uh, was cheese balls. Uh, and now you're not using the cheese balls. I, I'm assuming it was just a little bit too much orange going on right there. But uh, are, you, are you? I can it bring it back. Like, huh, no, it's fine. I, I think it's fine. I think it's, it, it, you know, I don't know if you'd literally want to be covered in cheese balls all the time. Yours, <laughs> pro probably, but. Yeah, no, you'll, you'll actually like this. I, I, I did a, uh, a quick panel on sustainability recently, and, um, you know, we can talk about it in a bit. But I was actually flipping back and forth between the cheese ball background and the cracker background. Um, so it was left over from that. You know, Pip Snacks is such an interesting brand. And I remember when you guys uh, got off the ground and I thought of it as this really artisanal type product and positioned brand. Uh, and frankly, and forgive me for saying this, I never really saw it as being a big brand. Um, and I think, you know, maybe that was the packaging. It was that sort of brown paper, that brown paper packaging. It was the fact that it was heirloom popped corn. Um, you know, did you guys ever see Pip Snacks? Do you see Pip Corn is, is scaling to the point where it is today? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting you say that because I think that speaks to, you know, how our brand started in the beginning. It was very much bootstrapped, authentically, just Jeff, Jen, and I wanting to, to do something for ourselves and bring an heirloom popcorn to market that we knew people would love eating. You know, we weren't we did it a different way. We didn't go out and raise, you know, millions of dollars. We took $3,000 that we had in savings and we launched it. But I do think we've always, from the early days of the first time we had that heirloom popcorn, we knew we had something that could be big, um, but we wanted to make sure that we grew our business the way, you know, our consumers would want, you know, and continue kind of being loyal to us. And so we spent six years focused on growing our popcorn. Um, but, you know, we were in the kitchen, you know, I remember like Jeff and I in our book and apartment, we made our first corn dipper literally out of a pasta extruder that we ordered on Amazon now um, that came to our apartment in, in two hours. We had soaked our corn for, you know, overnight and we were trying to figure out how can we make this into a chip? And the first chip was a fried, literally like pasta shaped corn dipper that we fried in our apartment. And we, it was like, when is the time right to launch it? Um, and so we had all of this in the background and, you know, Whole Foods, which has been an amazing partner to us. They were our first uh, retailer back in 2014. They took us national. Um, the time was right with them in 2018, where they really understood the vision of how do we make this artisanal um, brand into a platform of heirloom snacks. And so, you know, you talked about our cheese balls, um, you know, Jeff mentioned our crackers. So, you know, we've been able to take that artisanal history and focus on heirloom and sustainability, but make it more commercial with products that I think resonate with you know, maybe more, more of the masses, right? So like heirloom cop, popcorn, cheese balls, corn dippers, snack crackers. We have a lot more um, items that we've been playing around in the kitchen with, but yeah, it's exciting to see the ability to kind of scale the brand um, into more of like a, a mass appeal uh, product line. Jeff, you look like you wanted to say something uh, about that POS extruder and that first corn chip. Yeah, I, it, Teresa brought me back to that moment in the kitchen. What the one part in between that she that she skipped between soaking corn kernels and putting it into a pasta extruder is we actually also had to use our juicer to um, grind the corn from kernels to like a masa, you know, dough. We literally brought out our juicer, and there's probably still pieces of dried masa in there. But those are the days of definitely like a, a lot of home R and D. Like Teresa said, it was always we always had this dream of building this heirloom corn based kind of platform of snacks. And over the years, even though we were focused on popcorn, we were definitely tinkering all the time. 
Now, heirloom is a word that you guys use obviously quite a bit in how you promote and market the product, but I think it's a term that um, some folks may not be too familiar with. For listeners who are not, how do you define heirloom? So heirloom in general, and whether you're talking about uh, a family heirloom or uh, you know food and seed saving, it's something that has been preserved you know, over generations, right? There's not a, uh, like here to be heirloom, you have to be X number of years old and you've had to go through this process. It's not the same as some other, like there's no certification to say, okay, you're officially heirloom. Um, so it's kind of up to, you know, individual, you know, brands to, to, to dig into the history and understand the history, which obviously helps in preserving the history. But for us and on all the research we've done, you know, our version of heirloom is, you know, many, many generations. So our corn, you can trace back to textbooks, you know, 100, 200 years. Uh, and and you, can, you can really start to get to the origin of where this corn was. It's difficult because it wasn't always documented. But our corn, the little ears of corn with the really delicate shells is as close as you'll get to like Native American popcorn um, that, that still exists today. So it's, it truly is what we would consider and what the industry would consider an ancient grain. But it's not something that, um, you know, there's no steadfast rule of like, you have to be, you know, 500 years old to be considered heirloom. I think there is like a generally accepted three, four generations to really say like, okay, this has been saved now for four generations. And, you know, our corn is, is, is older than that. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty proud. And the kind of cool thing about heirloom too, is you, you, you learn, right? Like we're still learning the history of our corn and, and to me, that's really exciting because the more we know, the more we can communicate out and it makes it that much more special. But uh, we're really relying on different communities over time to document the saving of these seeds, to really trace it back to like the beginning. And uh, while we're still working on that, we can say with confidence that our corn is at, you know, a couple hundred years old um, and, uh, you know, we're still learning about it. There's a lot of new products that have come out over the past couple of years and you know they include the cheese balls the crackers the corn chips and they're all amazing um getting to the point where you can introduce those products uh was a bit of a journey um let's talk about uh teresa you mentioned uh whole foods and you know we had uh had a great conversation that we uh featured on clubhouse a few months back related to getting into your dream retailer. And it sounds like Whole Foods has been that great partner. How much did the uh, awareness of your brand via Shark Tank and via uh, Oprah's favorite things have to do with the performance of the brand on shelf? I mean, was were those two things, did those two things happen before or after um, you went to Whole Foods nationally? So they, they both happened um, before, uh, all right around that 2012 to 2014 timeframe, right before we were put in nationally um, with our popcorn at Whole Foods. And, you know, there were a lot of benefits that we were kind of hoping and expecting, and there were a bunch that were totally unexpected. Um, you know, with Oprah, it's a completely different thing because it's her, you know, her favorite things gift guide, right? It's a holiday gifting guide. Um, so after the holiday season's over, yeah, of course, there's a massive amount of, you know, like a huge amount of exposure and a ton of demand during the holidays. But then once the holiday season's over, it's really more on the brands that are featured to keep, keep the momentum um, versus Shark Tank, which is kind of a bit more evergreen because once those episodes get syndicated, you know, it's on TV pretty often. And we've benefited from doing a number of updates at this point, like where are they now kind of catching up with the brand and, you know, the executive producers at, at Shark Tank have been incredibly kind to us and, and, and Barbara is like number one fan and constantly advocating for us. So we've had those opportunities. And as a result, we're on TV now every 45 days or so kind of reminding people who we are. And we can definitely see, you know, the spikes in velocity on shelf, as well as on our website when we do have those updates. So, um, you know, I think one of the more unexpected benefits of something like Shark Tank specifically and, and Oprah too, would be like trade shows. Like it, it's an amazing thing when people see you on TV, they followed your journey a little bit. They feel like they know you, you know, to a certain extent. And we would have buyers coming up 
talking to us like they knew us. And it kind of broke down this barrier of like, we instantly have something to talk about, something to connect about. Um, maybe they know a little bit of the story and we can just reinforce and plug holes in the story and just connect. Um, and that has been an amazing thing that's come out of the Shark Tank and Oprah exposure is just that kind of familiarity with the brand, but also us as people um, where we can kind of just meet people at trade shows, buyers, you know, decision makers, and kind of already have a little bit of a connection because the, 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 the foodie community and those buyers specifically are generally huge Shark Tank fans because there's so many food companies that come through Shark Tank. They're really plugged into like what's new, what's happening here. Um, so that's been an amazing kind of fringe benefit that we weren't really expecting. That's been, you know, pretty material. Did you have to learn how to be sort of celebrity founders, quote unquote, celebrity founders in that, you know, um, people would come up to you and recognize you? I mean, were you already extroverted people or did you have to kind of adjust your communication style to you know, adapt to who you were or who you were in the minds of the industry? Yeah, such a great question. I, I, um, you know, I, I love uh, talking to people and connecting with people. Um, I definitely get that from my dad. He's like, he'll, he'll be in a room and he needs to go talk to everybody, like literally even you know, everybody. And I definitely, I'm not as extroverted as he is, but I definitely get it from him. Um, I will say that it was, you know, it, I, it, even the most extroverted people in the world still need a little bit of time to recharge, right? And I definitely wouldn't put put, you know, us in the, in the, in the realm of, you know, celebrity entrepreneurs. I really appreciate you saying that, but it's still kind of like, yeah, we are who we are, you know, we're kind of normal people and we love what we do, but I think it's just the, like, you kind of, you kind of can't turn it off sometimes, you know, like, and I was really surprised by the number of times people would, would like recognize me on the street. Like I was shocked, you know, we were living in New York city and people would recognize me and maybe it was my glasses and my hair and people would recognize me and, you know, not everyone has the best day every day, you know, but you kind of have to, you know, if, if, if someone recognizes you, you know, you want them to leave with a good impression of you and the brand and you're always representing the brand. And I think that was, you know, at times a bit challenging where it's like, if I'm, if it's super early in the morning and I'm out walking the dog, you know, I kind of don't really want to talk about popcorn, but, um, you know, people are just so excited that you kind of meet their level of excitement and, uh, you know, just tell the story and give them as much time as they want to chat about it. I have a very funny story. Um, Jeff and I love going to the movies and we love movie theater popcorn, like even before Pipcorn and Shark Tank had just aired and we were at the movie theater and we bought movie theater popcorn because we've just loved we love it you know we we love popcorn um clearly we launched a popcorn business um and the movie's about to start jeff's putting his hand into this big tub of popcorn and the lady next to me leans forward she's with her daughter they pull out a bag of popcorn that they had snuck into the movie theater and she goes, I saw you on Shark Tank. You're the oh, founder no. of Pipcorn. <laughs> Why are you eating movie theater popcorn? <laughs> and it oh, was, I goodness. think, in that moment that we realized, like, whoa, there is this, like, celebrityness because we were just in our everyday life, you know, um, doing some, you know. And so we felt like, whoa, you know, I think for Jeff, it was like, okay, like, this is, like, a different life now. Um, but it was just such a funny I'm sorry, Jeff, I told that story, but it was such a funny experience that we had um, that we just, you, you, you can't expect, you know, um, coming out of like the Shark Tank experience. Well, it, it really speaks to what you guys are trying to do with this brand because you can appreciate junk food, but junk food doesn't have to be junky. I think that's been proven over and over in the past few years. What had been salty snacks can be better for you, can be in some cases healthy. And I think that really is clear, clearly what you're trying to achieve. Yes, movie theater popcorn tastes great. There are ways to make it healthier. And you guys seem to be trying to do that in a number of different categories. Um, before we get to innovation, I want to stick with you know the founder story for a second, because there are three founders. Um, and I often see you together um, when you are uh, at a trade show or marketing the product or talking about the brand or on Instagram or, or what have you. You know, I, I think 
delegating responsibilities is something that we've talked about a bit on this podcast and, you know, how not just, you know, co-founders coexist, but how they thrive together. And uh, Teresa and Jeff, you guys are married. Jen, Jeff is your sister. Teresa, Jen is your sister-in-law. I mean, I feel like all these things, you have a lot of things going on. How do you make it work uh, cohesively in a way that keeps you happy on a personal level, first and foremost, but thriving on a business, on a business level? You know, I think that's what is so special. And what I love about Pipcorn is that, um, like Jeff, Jen and I are, we can do it together and we're not trying to kill each other because I do think, you know, it's a lot of stress. You're trying to grow a business. Um, and we're also family, but I think what's so magical about, you know, the three of us is that we bring really different skill sets to the table, but also we're very similar. Um, so, you know, even like decisions that we have to make, I feel like we're just so attuned to each other because we're family that it's not big discussions, you know, like we're all kind of on the same page. We trust each other. We've all, um, I think have similar uh, like personalities and values in terms of the mission for our business. And so from that perspective, I think that's what's been, you know, allowing us to kind of work together, build a business, be successful, but also like in the background, like we're all best friends. Like we're constantly laughing. Jen comes to our house all the time with her girlfriend and we're, we play Monopoly and we're not talking about Pipcorn. So I think that we've been able to figure out a way of like living our life as a family unit, but then also like, we also have a business that we're running. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you feel differently. I hope, I hope that <laughs> what I said was accurate. <laughs> I saw Jeff's eyebrows raised for a second when you started speaking, Teresa, but maybe that was maybe in, 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 the, affirm in the affirmative, he was raising his eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that's exactly right. I, I totally agree. It's, um, you know, we, I think that there's, there's complementary skills for sure. Um, but then there's some overlapping, you know, experiences and skills too. It, it like all in the right places. And, and I think that's a pretty incredible thing. Uh, and I think that the fact that we're a family business and, you know, we work so well together, but we are also like a family who is very close. There's just this inherent level of, you know, comfort and trust that I, I'm not saying can't exist outside of our dynamic, but it's just naturally there. And I think that is another thing that's just like, I want to wake up and do my very best every single day for, you know, obviously our kids, but also like Teresa and Jen, like, I don't want to let anybody, I don't want to let them down. And there's like a, there's like a, a, a you know, it, it maybe on a tough day, it's easier to stay focused. Cause like, I have these two people that rely on me for a certain set of things that like, I, I like more than anything else, I don't want to let them down. And not, more than that, like, I want to do the best job I can do, right? So I think there's there, there's that dynamic, which is real a really positive one. Um, and then, like, we just, like Teresa kind of mentioned, you know, we really like to be around each other and have a good time. So I think that, uh, you know, I have a, so much respect uh, for single founders. Like, I don't know. We talk about it a lot. Like, it, it's the, you know, this journey is, is, is a, a wild ride. And you know, having two people that, you know, are this close to me, that are family, that I trust, that I love, uh, it just makes the, the tough days so much easier and the great days so much better. And it's kind of like, it, we, we try to hard to balance each other out. And I think that's a big thing in entrepreneurship is like that we're keeping that balance. So I'm, I'm thankful every day to have the support that I do because it, you know, it, it keeps me balanced and, and that's, you know, to me, very important. Oftentimes when I, when I come across uh, a brand or a company that was founded by three people, I think about um, a trio, like a musical trio and um, more, more often than that in, in sort of rock terms. So I'm, I'm thinking of like a, a police or the or rush or bands like that. Um, do you ever have to rotate when you think about who's the lead singer, who's the uh, lead guitarist, who's the drummer, et cetera? Do you ever have to rotate those roles or are those roles a little bit more defined um, because I didn't see, you know, if, if you go to LinkedIn, I don't see that, that there's a CEO uh, for your roles. They all say co-founder. Yeah, it's another phenomenal question. I, 
without a doubt over the years there, you know, there's been a cycling of, of, and it could be day to day, right. Or it could be longer, you know, longer stretches, but I think in different phases of business um, there's been different kind of, you know, maybe more, more of a leadership role from one person or, or, you know, over another. Um, but I think, uh, you know, also being family, like we're, we're together pretty often. So it doesn't slow us down to make decisions as a trio, like, you know, major decisions. It doesn't slow us down to set strategies as a trio. Um, so more often than not, you know, we are making decisions as a, as a group um, and, and being really careful to not, not be slowed down and, and, you know, because of that dynamic. But I definitely can think of a couple of moments in the business history where, you know, one person has like stuck their arm, you know, their hand up and said like, you know, I can lead us through this experience and, and, and maybe not so directly, but, um, you know, kind of that's, you know, I, I, Teresa, maybe you disagree, but I feel like I've, I can think of a couple of moments. Uh, and I, I, th I think fundraising is a big one. My mentality is like, what's the problem? I want to fix it. Um, and so that was definitely, I feel like where my mind went immediately. What I think what I had to do that I was not used to doing and I learned a lot from was ask for help. Um, I'm not good at doing that. <laughs> um, and so I think what we had to do and what I'm so grateful for is that we had partners. Um, we had a debt partner. Um, we had friends and family. We had vendors that let us, you know, sort of like hold on to some of the invoices that we owed um, because they believed in us. They trusted us and they believed in our product. And I think in order for us to get through that period, it was a lot of um, leaning, not leaning, but kind of like uh, banding together in terms of all of the relationships that we had built, you know, up to that point. And that's really what got us through where then we could, you know, go back out and, and raise money successfully. So I think the thing I learned from that experience was like, it's not just on Jeff, Jen and I, you know, we, it's okay to ask for help. And we did, um, and ever, and I think it's through those partners and you know friends and family that kind of continued to believe in what we were doing allowed us to get through. And you're aligned now with a company called Factory LLC. Uh, talk about how that relationship came about and why it made most sense for you in terms of the next stage of development for Pip for Pip Snacks. Yeah, um, yeah. So we. We had actually met um, the partners at Factory at a trade show um, before they were even, I think, had launched their fund and their services. Um, and if I'm remembering correctly, I think we we essentially like in our as we went back out and started fundraising, we were reconnected, you know, because we had connected with them um, probably a year before, and the timing had worked out pretty perfectly where they had successfully raised their $250 million fund. Um, they had opened their um, building here in Pennsylvania. And so what Factory represented was uh, funding and uh, an ability to manufacture or at least um, uh, build out an R&D department that you didn't necessarily have access to before. Is that is that an accurate way of saying it? Yeah, yeah, just so the the model is essentially, you know, investment plus, right? And and, and the plus is services um, in in many forms, whether that's, you know, R and D support, product development support, um, you know, accounting support, logistics, uh, supply chain support. Um, you know, there's uh, th there's there's a whole host of services. So, what we loved about, you know, the you know working with the factory team was like we can very quickly scale without having to go through the process of hiring a, a you know, a number of people, we, we found that very attractive. And at the same time, the factory squad and, you know, Rich Thompson, the managing partner at factory, you know, he, he, he saw what we saw. And I think that's, you know, pretty rare, like the, the ability to grow this from, you know, what it, what it was historically in popcorn. And when we started the conversations, we had just gotten accepted. We had just gotten our innovation accepted into Whole Foods. We had just gotten our, some new products that we had been working on behind the scenes, and you know, really trying to work with a with a juicer and a pasta extruder to 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 perfect. 
we had just gotten some of that innovation accepted. So Rich really saw this, you know, the, the opportunity to bring this from a popcorn thing to, you know, a family of snacks. And it's always been our, like we use Annie's as our North star, right? Like what they've done uh, and they had such, such a strong brand to, to translate across multiple categories in different parts of the store. We saw a very similar and, and doing that on the back of organic when nobody was doing that with organic, we saw something, an opportunity very similar with heirloom. And of course that's, you know, they, they've done it better than anybody, but that was our aspirational goal was like, we can do that with heirloom. Um, and Rich definitely saw that. But to that point, um, scaling heirloom sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like something where you're scaling something that was intended to be not scaled. So how does that work when you are trying to d- communicate this notion of small batch, which I guess I'm going to use that word interchangeably with heirloom um, to, you know, a, a public that doesn't necessarily may, may not necessarily know what that term means um, and why it's important. Yeah. The, I mean, um, it, it's, it's such a great question because it's something that we wrestle and have wrestled with over the years behind the scenes nonstop, which is like, we have this, we have access to this corn, right? It's this heirloom corn. We didn't, we didn't make it. We don't grow it, but we know it exists. And we knew it was special. We knew it was super delicious, crazy high quality. And the loving care that's gone into preserving it over the years um, is, is a special thing. You know, it takes a lot of work to be a seed saver, you know, to go and find the best, most resilient, most delicious, most beautiful highest quality seeds and save those year after year. So the crop itself gets better every year, you know, hypothetically and noticeably better over generations. Like it's a, it's a better product than it was, you know, 200 years ago. And that's because of the work that goes into it. So like you mentioned, heirloom is not meant to be a, a, you know, a, a, a commercial product and there's no industry for heirloom to be. I think over the years, what we've benefited from, from a, from a, from a communications perspective is, you know, heirloom tomatoes have done an incredible, you know, job and, and, and a super heavy lift to educate on at the high, at a high level, at a surface level, you know, it's better, it's, it's, it's delicious, it's seasonal, it's a little bit premium, right? So we had this base of, you know, heirloom wasn't a new concept, but on the supply chain, on, on, on the supply chain side, growing the supply chain for an heirloom ancient grain company, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still, it, and I think, for me, it's because we care so much about the history. It still stresses me out. Like we, 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 we grow this stuff and we've turned it into a commercially viable product, but all along the way, we are making sure every action we take, every seed we plant, every, every ear we harvest is not doing damage to the history of the seeds. And we're, you know, preserving all that history. We're contributing and hopefully in a shorter period of time, we can actually improve upon it because now we have a larger seed stock to pull from to get those best seeds because we're growing this whole thing. So um, it's something that we're, we're, you know, very much, you know, plugged into our impact uh, on, on this seed. And how do we make that impact, you know, resoundingly positive and not at all negative. And that's something that we is never lost on us and something that we spend a ton of time thinking about. Um, and then on, on the, on the consumer side of things, it's like, how do we equate heirloom to something? And how do we drive that nail in that like heirloom is super delicious and it's special and it's been improved upon over time. It's so special in fact that these seeds are literally saved and planted the next year. That's how we're not buying our seeds from a seed farm. They're from the, from the field. We're literally saving the best of the best. And that like, that's a pretty special thing too that um, consumers have really latched onto. But it's, it's a challenge in, in, in many ways on the, on the supply chain side no consumer ever sees that, but it's an incredibly important process to us because be, more than anything else, we want to protect the history. We don't want to, we don't want to destroy it. But isn't it an easier message just to say, hey, our popcorn is better for you. Our cheese balls are better for you. Our corn chips are better for you. I think that term is a little bit easier for folks to consume than we're protecting uh, the environment. We're protecting a crop. We're protecting a lot of things that you might not understand, but it's important to us. I think, you know, which message is really, I, are you trying to tell both stories at the same time or which one is really moving the needle for, for Pipsnacks? 
Yeah. You know, for us, it's, you know, the, the, the term better for you in our industry is, is uh, it's an important one, but it's, in my opinion, it's, it's used, you know, kind of broadly. Um, where I think what's unique to Pipcorn is we can tell a story around better ingredients. We can tell a story around better nutrition, but we can also tell a story around Sam and Norm and Andrea, who literally are growing our corn. They're getting, you know, more, more money per pound than what they would be growing, you know, otherwise. So there's a really amazing, like domestic, you know, U S farming angle that, um, you know, we're just now beginning to tell these stories of these people who have been so instrumental in us being able to grow our business over the years. Um, but at the same time saying like, yeah, you know, we're lower in sodium because of, of these practices that we do. And we're higher in fiber because of these things that we do. And on our newer snacks, you know, our cheese balls, right? Better for you cheese ball, 100%. But why is it better? It's because we're using 100% real cheese. We're not, we're not, you know, adding natural flavors, artificial flavors to boost that cheese flavor. All of that cheese that you're tasting is from 100% real cheese. And like that to us is, uh, you know, telling those stories on a more granular level, talking about the real cheese that we use, the heirloom corn. We think the sum of the parts are definitely greater. And when we can, from a sourcing perspective, do what we think is the right thing to do, you know, use paprika instead of, you know, other, other food coloring. Um, when you, when you tell the whole story, we think it, it really resonates. So yeah, I mean, saying better for you, for sure. People love it. it it's 100% true and we're proud of it. But why is it better for you? Why is it better for the planet? Why, is, why are we building a super strong, really responsible supply chain? Those are stories that we're starting to tell that we're really excited about too. Yeah, and I think, you know, what we're excited about is like the momentum behind heirloom. Because I think that's a great question, Ray. Like, do consumers understand or know what that means? Um, you know, when Google search, I think COVID has driven it, like heirloom within food and bev has increased like over 60%. Oprah came out and said, like, I'm only going to eat heirloom fruits and vegetables for 30 days. Um, and that's what's like the secret sauce to why, like what Jeff mentioned, we can use eight real ingredients in our cheese ball versus the 25 bad ingredients in the ones that we grew up eating, you know, in the plastic jugs, because the heirloom corn we're using, the base is already taste so delicious and is already so high quality. So the heirloom allows us to kind of create a, a better for you or simple ingredient or real ingredient product, because we don't have to add a lot of things to kind of like cover up the taste of the cheap corn. We're actually trying to highlight the heirloom corn and how just inherently it tastes better. So, you know, I think we're excited about kind of like people becoming more educated about um, heirloom being not just heirloom tomatoes, but, you know, and other plants and seeds as well. Um, and kind of being like the, you know, the leader in terms of educating people and like coming out saying like, this is a better way of eating. Well, what you just said and how you described the brand and your products to me sounds a lot better than what uh, Pipcorn had been tagged with for a name, which was the Shark Tank popcorn. Now, <laughs> when I saw that, I'm like, I wonder how Jeff and Teresa feel about that now. Maybe, you know, a while back, it was, it was a good thing, but um, does, that, does, does that Shark Tank, I know we talked about how much of it was a benefit and how much of it continues to be a benefit to you guys. But um, is that association still a good one? I mean, is it helpful to be the Shark Tank popcorn or have you tried to, has it been kind of difficult to, to break away from that? Yeah, a, a, a little bit of both, right? Like search engine optimization is an incredibly powerful thing. And when you have Shark Tank attached to you, it's, it's all good, right? It's super positive. You get a lot of eyeballs um, and, and that, you know, that, clearly helps. And then obviously having Barbara on our side is, it, it, I have no words for how, how, how much we appreciate that. But being labeled Shark Tank popcorn, because that's what we were back then, it does, there is a bit of a challenge to say like, well, we're more than popcorn now, right? So I think that's where the only negative I would say comes in is uh, all of that history of Shark Tank popcorn, Shark Tank popcorn, which again, massive benefit to the brand because it's crazy good exposure that lives on forever on the internet and it, it does make it way easier to find our brand. But what it what it blocks is, um, you know, 
we talked to a lot of people that are like, oh, I didn't know you had other snacks because I remember you as a Shark Tank popcorn brand. So, um, you know, that's that's one thing I would say probably the only thing that it has has been a bit of a challenge is is, is trying to educate and get the word out um, that we're you know now we're more than popcorn and which is easy to do on shelf, but just given that the given all, all the work and you know having such a strong presence online because of things that we don't even say right other people are saying it over and over. Um, to trying to, to trying to show people that we have more than popcorn, I think it was has been the main challenge. And T, I, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but yeah, I think so. You know, I think Shark Tank was such a blessing in our business. Barbara, you know, is an amazing partner. Um, but I also think you know the exposure comes with with some um, areas that then we have to manage. And we've talked to other Shark Tank brands as well. Of it's such a powerful marketing vehicle. So then to try to break through and then tell it our story of where the business is today, you know, is, is, is harder. Cause you kind of have to like, you know, tell, you know, the, the press outlets or, you know, the people we're talking with, like, it's, we're not just a shark tank brand. So to kind of like grow up from that, where I feel like our business has, you know, we've, we've like in the last two years, I think uh, quadrupled the size of our business. You know, we're in a very different place to where we were when we were on Shark Tank. Um, it's a fine balance of, of continuing to, to I think, um, tell the Shark Tank story, where I do feel like we have consumers that kind of want to keep knowing what Pipcorn is doing, but then also kind of get the message out of where we are today successfully to kind of the new consumers um, that we've been able to attract with our new portfolio of snacks. Are you comfortable with where the company is right now? Um, it sounds like a lot of what you intended to achieve back in 2012 is coming to fruition now. Um, do you find yourself being in, in a place of content? Yeah, you know, I think we're never content. Um, we, we have a lot more ideas um, in terms of, 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 of products we can launch in this heirloom snacks platform. Um, so we're very excited about continue to be seen, um, you know, in the industry, but also by our consumers as like innovators. Um, so we definitely have a pipeline of products. Um, you know, I think we've, we've historically focused on the natural channel. Um, but I wouldn't say that's where our goal was. You know, I think we've always wanted to just give people access to better snacks at an affordable price point. And if you look at, you know, we're using corn that costs two, three times more than what else is on the shelf, but our SRP on shelf is pretty aligned with what else is sitting there with us. Um, so I'd say like goals for us is expanding distribution, um, you know, into outside of natural, continuing to kind of give our consumers more access to our products. Um, we have a lot behind the scenes on social missions, sustainability missions that we spend a lot of time on um, because, you know, I think the great thing about the industry we're in is it's like this family of entrepreneurs that just want to make a difference. And that's been really fun to partner with other founders. You know, we're BIPOC founders. We, um, you know, we're, we're different than the legacy sort of CPG uh, industry that's out there. And so to continue to support other minority founders that want to do what we did, women, um, founders and entrepreneurs, you know, I think we spend a lot of time in the background too, just supporting our social causes. Big thing for us that we're not done with is like our sustainability missions too. Um, there's a lot that we're doing to, um, just continue to be better. Um, and, you know, make a, make a larger impact um, on the world than just the Shark Tank popcorn company. <laughs> uh, it's been really amazing speaking with you both. I feel like, you know, it's been a long time coming, you know, because in, in a lot of ways, I, I came into this industry right around the same time you guys did. And uh, to see you grow into the business that you've grown into is is just tremendous. It's really amazing to just to, to to be a part of it, just having this conversation. So thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me. I really appreciate it and uh, hope to catch up with you in person uh, later this year. Thank you so much for having us. We were, uh, right before we dialed in, we were downstairs talking about how excited we were to talk. So, and we were doing the same thing last night. So, uh, <laughs> so appreciate it and uh, look forward to connecting again soon. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, thank you. Thank this you. is great.